writing for a drug dealer in that story on all things considered from NPR news all things considered this afternoon at four o'clock until six thirty with Bill Bicot on ninety one point seven W C W mostly sunny today you may see a little rain early this evening the high eighty four showers ending overnight the low sixty the screensaver is on video is recording follow the largest live fire exercises on record involving the U.S. and South Korea. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin is reaffirming the U.S.'s long-term support for Ukraine as Ukrainian troops continue to fight Russian forces who invaded the country nearly 16 months ago. The Ukrainian forces have shown outstanding bravery and skill. Ukraine's fight is a marathon and not a sprint. Austin was speaking today in Brussels ahead of a meeting of NATO defense ministers. The Greek Coast Guard says the death toll stands at 79 after a fishing boat capsized off southern Greece this week. It was carrying hundreds of migrants when it sank, and authorities fear the death toll will end up being much higher. As Lydia Emanuidou reports from Athens, questions are being raised about the boat. The EU border agency Frontex said in a statement that its surveillance aircraft spotted the boat on Tuesday morning and that it informed Greek and Italian authorities. The Greek Coast Guard says its offer to assist the vessel was rejected by those on board because they wanted to reach Italy. Refugee advocates are questioning that claim and say more could have been done to bring the people to safety before the boat capsized. This is NPR News from Washington. Good morning. It's 832, 63 degrees in Cincinnati. This is 91.7 WVXU. I'm Marianne Zalesnik. The Kids Count Initiative is out with its annual report on how children are doing across America. WFPL's Morgan Watkins reports it examined 16 indicators of children's well-being. Kentucky's performance got worse on more than half of them. Kentucky fell to number 40 in the 50 state rankings for overall child well-being. Indiana improved, rising to number 24. Terry Brooks leads the organization Kentucky Youth Advocates. He's disappointed by the findings for the Bluegrass State. We should all look at this report with some degree of alarm because we are flat out headed in the wrong direction when it comes to kids. Brooks hopes the report will generate conversations among state lawmakers about how to better prioritize children in government policymaking. I'm Morgan Watkins in Louisville. Ohio ranks 38th in the nation with 276,000 children living in high poverty areas. That's according to the report from the Annie E. Casey Foundation. Librarians at Miami University voted unanimously yesterday to form a union. They joined the school's faculty in starting collective bargaining units. The librarians were originally excluded from the university's union election earlier this year that only included tenured and tenured tracked professors. The vote count will be certified by the state in July. Indiana University is helping to track electric and gas utility disconnections across the country. Researchers with IU's Energy Justice Lab hope a new dashboard will raise awareness about energy insecurity and encourage policies that protect vulnerable losers. Kerwin Olson with the consumer advocacy group the Citizens Action Coalition says it's thrilled to see this info being made available to the public and policymakers. But he says data on things like disconnections and unpaid bills should be taken with a grain of salt. Well, the major data gap, to be clear, is that the state of Indiana does not require that utilities report this information. Many, many states require either monthly or quarterly or at least annual reporting. Olson says the state needs to make the data available if it wants to ensure all Hoosiers have access to affordable energy. 
Indiana's winter moratorium on disconnects only protects Hoosiers eligible for federal assistance with their bills. There is not a similar moratorium for the summer. Reds over the Royals yesterday, 7-4. to four. Support comes from Graders, handcrafting indulgent ice cream in Cincinnati for generations, shipping coolers of ice cream from coast to coast. Graders ice cream. Support for NPR comes from this station and from Raymond James, a firm focused on transforming lives, businesses, and communities through tailored wealth management, banking, and capital market solutions. Learn more at RaymondJames.com. And from Britbox, with the latest season of Father Brown, Season 10. This and more mysteries following unofficial detectives, including Miss Marple and Jonathan Creek, streaming at Britbox.com slash NPR. This is NPR. It's Morning Edition from NPR News. I'm e. Martinez in Culver City, California. And I'm Layla Faulted in Washington, D.C. Southern Baptists are cracking down on women in ministry. They did so this week at their annual meeting by voting to finalize the expulsion of two congregations with women pastors and moving to change their own constitution. NPR religion correspondent Jason DeRose reports. Earlier this year, Southern Baptist leaders expelled Fern Creek Baptist Church in Kentucky, where a woman has led the congregation for decades, and well-known Saddleback the megachurch in Southern California where a woman serves as campus pastor. Those expulsions were based on a document passed in the year 2000 called the Baptist Faith and Message, which restricts the office of pastor to men. Meeting in New Orleans, nearly 13,000 delegates called messengers, predominantly white men, heard appeals from the expelled churches, but those appeals failed. Then they turned to an amendment to the Southern Baptist Constitution itself that says the church affirms, appoints, or employs only them as any kind of pastor or elder. Sarah Clapworthy of LifePoint Baptist Church in San Angelo, Texas, was among the smaller group of women messengers. She spoke in favor of the amendment. We must stand our ground and keep the doors shut to venomism and liberalism. In a culture that is increasingly unclear about the roles of when men and women, or what a man or woman is, we have to be crystal clear. Clapworthy said that her church believes women shouldn't teach men or hold religious authority over them. We should leave no room for our daughters and granddaughters in the generations ahead to have confusion on where the SBCC stands. Let them know that scripture is our authority and not the culture. But that belief isn't uniform among all Southern Baptists. Bob Bender, pastor emeritus of Cross Fellowship Church in Colorado Springs, Colorado, defended the right of women to serve as pastors. Southern Baptist brothers and sisters, I beg of you, do not do this. All the liberals have left us. It looks like we conservatives are left to fight amongst ourselves. Bender hearkened back to the Southern Baptist Convention's past to underscore his point. Southern Baptists have been right on a lot of things and wrong on a few. We were wrong on slavery, segregation, alien immersion, and disallowing biblically divorced men to become deacons. History will prove us wrong again if we adopt this motion. In the end, the amendment banning women pastors passed. Next year's Southern Baptist Convention meeting will have to pass it again before it officially takes effect. Jason Torres, NPR News. China has an unemployment problem. The latest figures were published today, and they weren't great. Overall, unemployment for May was 5.2%. But for young Chinese, those in the 16 to 24 age range, unemployment hit a record 20.8%. NPR's John Ruich investigates why that number is so high. The Lama Temple in Beijing is a labyrinth of shrines and courtyards filled with incense, smoke, and people. In one corner, there's a room where a monk chants prayers and rings a bell. Visitors in batches of a couple dozen at a time rotate through for a few minutes each. Inside, they hold aloft bracelets of prayer beads to get blessed. A lot of the visitors these days are like Rachel Gao and Jose Chiu, who come from Shanghai. We are graduating soon and we need to find jobs. We're doing this to have a little, how do I say it? 
<laughs> Paying money to have someone watch over us. Gao and Chiu are graduate students at a top university in Shanghai studying economics and math. They're in Beijing for an internship, and they took half a day off to come to the Lama Temple. We're considered people with pretty good educations, and we face really heavy employment pressure. So I can't imagine what the pressure is like for undergrads or people from not-so-great schools. The pressure is bad. Six months after the government ended strict COVID controls, the economy is still struggling to bounce back. The private sector is hobbled by unfavorable policies, and uncertainty about the future is widespread. Young people have been flocking to the Lama Temple from around the country, lining up for hours to buy prayer beads here, hoping the charmed bracelets can boost their job prospects. Whether you believe in it or not, it's worth a try, right? This is definitely an unemployment crisis for Chinese youth. Wang Dan is chief economist for China at Hang Seng Bank in Shanghai. A lot of the companies in big cities, and they're trying to do restructuring this year. So the fresh graduates. There are expected to be a record 11.6 million fresh graduates this year, many bringing high expectations to the job market. So the authorities are trying to temper that, encouraging them to think outside the box. In Guangdong province, for instance, the local government wants young people to go into the countryside for work. And state media have been promoting a catchphrase from China's leader, Xi Jinping. Meaning, seek out your own hardship. For 25-year-old Alex Luo, just landing a job has been a hardship of its own. Luo studied design in college, but can't find work in the field. When we meet her at a job fair in Shanghai, she says she's already sent out a few hundred resumes. I did hear back from some, but then you talk about salary and benefits and working hours, right? And it often doesn't fit. Most of the companies here are looking for salespeople. Laura says she'd be fine with that, even though it doesn't have anything to do with what she studied. And that kind of mismatch highlights a potential problem for policymakers, says Jin Koyu, an associate professor at the London School of Economics. You have master's students lining up in cigarette factories or becoming nannies in order to uh, be employed. So that, that leaves um, a significant portion of the, the population and their families quite disgruntled. And that, Jin says, could make it harder for the government to address some of China's thorniest long-term challenges. Unless their expectations are filled, they're not going to get married, which is a big problem. You know, they might not want to have kids because of the anxiety and the insecurity and the uncertainty. Um, so it leads to a host of present pressing problems. More and more college graduates are punting, applying for graduate programs to delay reality a little bit. Back at the Lama Temple in Beijing, Jose Chiu just shakes his head. In our school, there were more grad students who entered this year than undergrads. So it feels like there's no one fed.
Support comes from listeners like you and from Richmond, Indiana, Shakespeare Festival's production of the romantic comedy As You Like It at McGuire Hall at the Richmond Art Museum, June 16th through June 25th. Featuring original music, and the show can be seen along with the museum's 125th anniversary exhibit. Tickets at richmondshakes.org. Night first morning weather, mostly sunny. There's a chance of rain this evening. The high temperature, 84. Showers ending tonight, the low 60, and then sunny tomorrow getting up to 80. Right now it's 63 in Cincinnati. I'm Lucy May. On the next Cincinnati edition, we've all heard stories of the Underground Railroad, but are some of the details incorrect? We talked to the author of the book, The Underground Railroad in Ohio. Then, local chefs discuss the history of soul food and share recipes for Juneteenth cookouts. Today at noon on Cincinnati Edition on 91.7 WBXU. Good morning. It's 845, 63 degrees in Cincinnati. This is 91.7 WBXU. I'm Marianne Zelesnik. For decades, athletes face harsh consequences for accepting money and gifts while playing college sports. But two years ago, the NCAA changed its rules, allowing athletes to profit off their name, image, and likeness, also known as NIL. WVXC's Matt Marion explains why these rules are making a big difference for local student athletes. At the University of Cincinnati, athletes from almost every sport have found ways to reap the benefits of these new rules. Screensaver is on. Video is recording.
afternoon during All Things Considered on 91.7 WBXU and 88.5 WMUB. WBXU goes wherever you do. Listen to 91.7 online at iHeartRadio.com and on your mobile device through the iHeartRadio app. Support comes from the YMCA. Focused on making this summer the season for trying new things, making friends, and belonging to a cause bigger than yourself. You can visit myy.org to learn more about programs and membership at the Y. That's myy.org. Support for WBHU comes from Broadway in Cincinnati. Subscription packages are on sale now for the upcoming 23-24 season. Featuring MJ the Musical, Mrs. Dogfire, Beetlejuice, Peter Pan, Six, and more. Packages and more information available at broadwayincincinnati.com. This traffic report is supported by Unbound.org. Westbound 275 between Lebanon Road and Mosteller, there's a ramp on the left shoulder. There's a broken down vehicle on the ramp from Turfway to northbound 71 and 75. And westbound 275 at Montgomery Road, there's a vehicle burned. For nine first morning weather, chance of some showers tonight. Once that ends, should see the Friday low of 60. Mostly sunny for Friday, a high tomorrow of 80. It's 83 degrees now. Thank you for tuning in this afternoon to All Things Considered on 91.7 WVXU. Support for NPR comes from this station and from Subaru and its retailers, partnering with the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society this June to give blankets and messages of hope to patients facing cancer. Learn more at Subaru.com slash care. From Roger and Gamble, maker of Z-Quil Pure Z's gummies, designed with melatonin for occasional sleeplessness to help people fall asleep naturally. Learn more at ZQuill.com. And from the sustaining members of this NPR station. From NPR News, this is All Things Considered. I'm Elsa Chang. And I'm Ari Shapiro. It's time for some science news from our friends at NPR's shortwave podcast. Emily Kwong and Regina Barber are the hosts, and they are here for our science roundup. Good to have you both back. It's so fantastic to be here, Ari. Right? Yeah, it's good to be back, Ari. What have you got for us this week? Uh, we've got three stories that let us all hang out in space together. It's true. We are leaving planet Earth for a little bit to check out a newly discovered asteroid, a new finding on a distant moon, and deepen our understanding of what space life even does to the brain. I gotta say, space has always kind of scared me, but I'm, I, I promise you to keep me safe. Let's go into orbit. Emily, what's first? Oh, you're in good hands. You're in good hands. Okay. This first story is about space flight and affects the brain. And it's a big topic of interest. Because if you think about it, commercial space flight is totally on the rise. Right? And it's not just like these short hops where people float around without gravity for a few minutes. They're actually heading the International Space Station. Yes, the future of space flight is looking expansive. We know what long-term space flight does to the body. There's the increased radiation, the social isolation, the weakening of your muscles and bones from the microgravity. But it turns out that space flight also changes your brain. Rachel Seidler studies this at the University of Florida. In the absence of gravity, the brain is actually sitting higher in the skull, and the top of the brain is a little bit compressed against the skull. There's also headward fluid shifts that happen in the absence of gravity. Gray matter shifts. The cerebral, cerebral spinal fluid in your body moves around too. A lot of first time astronauts are a report fluid build up in the face, what they call puppy head bird legs. <laughs> and we don't know how this affects someone's health long term. Rachel made me think about how this issue is colliding with our very evolution. Yeah, because we evolved with gravity. Emily, you're not making space any less scary for me right now. Yeah, I mean, we got to deal with the facts in front of us. You know, our bodies were designed for fluid to travel up, and without gravity, there's nothing to pull it down. So Rachel's study published in Scientific Reports last week looked at 30 astronauts. Those in space for two weeks saw minimal brain changes. But at six months, their brains saw a lot more changes. And astronauts who went for a year or more, there was no further change, kind of like a plateau, suggesting the brain was trying to adapt to space. And after people come back to Earth, did the brain changes reverse? Not really, at least not for a long time. 
one of the most typical things researchers see among astronauts post-flight is the cavities called ventricles deep in our brains expanding. They're trying to accommodate all of that fluid shift from living in a weightless environment. And interestingly enough, the Earth-bound astronauts whose last space flight was less than three years ago demonstrated less adaptation to all that fluid, less expansion in their brain. And that actually worries Rachel, because if these pockets of the brain aren't expanding to take up all that fluid, the brain itself may be getting compressed. We're not totally sure of the health risks of any of this, but she worries that the potential pressure on the brain for two full time on Earth might not be a good thing. So what's the solution apart from just jumping into space? Or spending more time on Earth between space flights to uh, okay. allow the body to kind of recalibrate. I mean, this is the kind of research and data we need, right, to figure out what to do. It's a new area of study, space flight in the brain. It only began less than a decade ago. And if we're going to go to space, which we clearly want to do, work like this can help inform <laughs> for yourself. Fair. Some private citizens and a lot of space companies want to do. Work like this can help inform more thoughtful policies about what would be healthy when it comes to the humans spending time in space. Okay, our second space story comes from you, Regina, and it, this is about water on one of Saturn's moons. Paint a picture for us. Yeah, I actually love the icy moons in our solar system. It's one of the reasons I got into astronomy. And also, a few of those icy moons show evidence of possible oceans underneath, like Enceladus that orbits Saturn. An ocean on Enceladus. Why do scientists think there's water there in the first place? Yeah, there is this really cool mission called the Cassini mission, and it flew by Enceladus numerous times, like between 2004 and 2017. And it collected data from a plume shooting liquid into space from Enceladus's surface. It was recently analyzed and it was published in the journal Nature, and the researchers detected amounts of phosphorus at higher levels than our oceans on Earth. And phosphorus may sound familiar, it's a macronutrient that makes pools become overrun with algae, right? You're totally right, Em, it's, it's a basic ingredient in fertilizer. Look, I'm a gardener, water plus fertilizer yeah. equals plant growth. Does that mean nice. anything is growing on this moon of Saturn? I mean, we, we always need to be careful when talking about life on other worlds, but phosphates in water can point to possible, possible habitability in an ocean that most likely exists under that ice. And I talked to a planetary geochemist, uh, Mikhail Zolotov, at Arizona State University, and he was not associated with the study. But he says it's a positive sign if there is life there, they wouldn't have to struggle like ocean organisms do in our oceans that don't have enough phosphorus. Okay, I'm really into this. How are they going to find out if there is actually life on this moon of Saturn? Yeah, that's for future missions, ones that look at these icy moons. There's one actually in the works, it's called Jupiter Icy Moon Explorer, or JUICE. But yeah, as for Enceladus, I mean, we can't rule it out, right? So that's pretty fun. Totally. Okay, third and final space story is about a newly discovered asteroid. Tell me it's not hurtling toward... UVXU, I'm Phil Reinhardt. The final ones for Lagoda Local Schools next superintendent have been announced. WVXU's Zach Carrion has more. The Lakota Board of Education has been searching for a new leader since January when former superintendent Matt Miller announced his resignation. Last night, the board released its short list of four candidates. Michael Lacombe, a chief operating officer for Solon City Schools near Cleveland. Todd Petrie, chief operating officer at Mason City Schools. Jason Spencer, director of school leadership at CPS. And Wyoming City Schools assistant superintendent Ashley Whiteley. One of these four will take over a district that's made headlines in recent years over battle surrounding discussions. The screensaver is on. Video is recording. Lakota's interim superintendent, Rob Vogelman, said earlier this year that he wasn't interested in the top job and will return to his role as assistant superintendent once a new leader is chosen. The board says it intends to fill the position by the end of the month. Zach Carrion, 91.7 WBXU. Former longtime alcohol lobbyist Mark Carmichael is Indiana Democrats' first candidate this cycle to announce a bid for the U.S. Senate run. Indiana Public Broadcasting's Brandon Smith reports Carmichael would face an uphill battle against the likely Republican Congressman Jim Banks.
carmichael spent nearly five years in the indiana house of representatives in the late eighty s and early ninety s. he also ran an unsuccessful campaign for congress in ninety ninety six. carmichael spent two decades as head of the indiana beverage alliance, a trade association for beer distributors, before retiring in twenty twenty. in a statement announcing his candidacy, the democrat laid out ten policy positions he'd work towards as a u s. senator. chief among them codifying abortion rights. he says he'll also seek to ban, in his words, military style assault weapons, take immediate action on climate change, and support l g b t q youth. the last indiana democrat to win a race for u s. senate was joe donnelly more than a decade ago. for indiana public broadcasting, i'm brandon smith at the state house. some scattered showers, maybe some thunder tonight as well. overnight low of sixty. for friday, mostly sunny skies, back up to around eighty for the high. it's eighty two degrees now. This is 91.7 WVXU and 88.5 WMUV. Support for NPR comes from this station and from Procter & Gamble, maker of Align Probiotic, a daily supplement to support digestive health, containing a probiotic strain developed by gastroenterologists with 20 years of research. More at AlignProbiotics.com. From Indeed, a hiring platform designed to streamline how businesses can attract, interview, and hire candidates. More at Indeed.com slash NPR. And from listeners like you, who donate to this NPR station. This is All Things Considered from NPR News. I'm Ari Shapiro in Washington. And I'm Elsa Chang in Culver City, California. Demand for clean energy is on the rise, but it's facing obstacles to growth. In a moment, we'll head to Pine Ridge, South Dakota to learn why. First, updated COVID vaccines are coming this fall, and they'll likely target a variant that's circulating now. That's the news out of a day-long meeting held by a panel of experts advising the Food and Drug Administration on vaccines. NPR's Ping Huang is here to tell us more about their decision. Hey there. Hey, Ari. There is already a vaccine that targets the Omicron variant. So what was the purpose of this meeting? You're right, Ari. The, the current version of the COVID vaccine essentially targets two versions of the virus. It's the original Wuhan strain and Omicron subvariants that were circulating last fall. So this is the current bivalent vaccine. But the problem is that the virus is constantly changing, so none of these versions are circulating now. So the question before the advisors today for the FDA was, does the vaccine need to be updated and how so? Especially as we get to the fall, which is a time when there could be a surge as people start spending more time indoors. And, and what was their decision? Well, everyone on the panel, there are 21 people on the panel, and everyone voted to update the vaccine to target a, uh, to target a substrain of Omicron. And there's probably going to be a few changes as a result. So first, they ditched the bivalent vaccine and are going forward with a monovalent vaccine, meaning it just targets Omicron. And there was also a lot of discussion about which COVID strain to go with. So they saw three options, and they recommended one called XBB 1.5. That's a strain that's been dominant for a few months now, and it's the one that the manufacturer can get out the quickest and all the strains they considered was pretty similar so a vaccine for any one of them should work pretty well for the others. You said they all voted for the update but there was a lot of discussion so like were there any dissenters, any disagreement, how confident are they that this is the best strategy? Yeah, you know, it, it, it got feisty and there was a debate on whether one yearly COVID shot is the right way to go forward. That's the strategy that we as a country use for seasonal flu, but COVID hasn't really settled into a seasonal pattern yet. Some of the doctors on the panel said maybe we should keep it flexible, we might, we might need a shot more frequently or less frequently depending on how things evolve. But Dr. Peter Marks of the FDA pushed back. Like, you know, I, I hate to be contrarian, but you know, from a public health perspective, people need to be able to understand what we're actually doing. And there's only so fast that our manufacturers can actually change things. He was saying that, practically speaking, companies making a new version of the COVID vaccine and a few hundred million doses of it, going forward, it's really only going to happen once a year. Would this shot be recommended for everyone or just like more vulnerable groups? And still an open question. I mean, everyone is not at equal risk. So the CDC shared some data today that shows that since last April, hospitalizations and deaths from COVID have been low in most groups. They have been disproportionately high in people who are over 75. So this might be this might be a group that needs extra protection. Those with health issues like diabetes or chronic lung diseases, they may also have higher risks. 
but it's not clear at the moment whether this is going to be a shot that everyone should get or just specific groups. So what is the process? What are the next steps going to be? So the FDA is going to take a few days to consider the committee's discussion. Um, they're probably going to issue an official recommendation soon, which is going to give the vaccine makers a, an okay on which variant to go with and a path to follow. The CDC will also weigh in a little bit later, and so when you sort of put that together, the new vaccines should be out in the fall, probably by around late September or early October. Just in time for back to school, NPR's Ping Pong, thank you. You're welcome. The dream of clean energy is becoming reality. Companies are drawing up plans for thousands of wind and solar projects all across the country. But many are running into a big obstacle. They can't get connected to the electricity grid. Dan Charles from NPR's Planet Money team looked into the reasons why. Kyle Jack wants to build a wind farm here on the grassy hills of the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. The turbine will be out by up north west of here, all through this area out here and over. Kind of in that direction. Yeah. It makes sense. This region is so windy. Yeah. Saudi Arabia wind. <laughs> Lyle convinced a majority of the native tribes in South Dakota to join forces and create a wind power company. Chetty Shakoli Power Authority. They're planning two big projects, but to connect their windmills to power lines, to send their clean electricity out into the world, they need permission in advance from the organization that manages the electricity grid in this region, the Southwest Power Pool, or SPP. And David Kelly, the vice president of engineering at SPP, says they have competition. So these two projects that you mentioned, they are just two of, uh, you know, just really hundreds of projects that are trying to be developed. Across the country, it's thousands waiting in a long line called the Interconnection Queue, trying to get permission to connect to the grid. Engineers like David have to figure out whether they can do that safely. They use computer simulations to see what happens in an imaginary world when they hook up new wind and solar farms. So we identify that there's a, a line that's overloaded, a transformer that's overloaded, a stability problem that, that occurs on the grid, and so we have to uh, identify a fix. The fix might be a bigger power line, new transformers, and a very important point, if you are building a wind farm and it's going to need some bigger power lines, you have to pay for it which can make or break a project. The Ocheti Shakoe Power Authority submitted its request to SPP in 2017. More than four years later, SPP replied. And, and it was just a kick in the gut. This is Caroline Hara, a consultant who's been working with Lyle Jack on this project. SPP said they'd have to pay for hundreds of miles of new or rebuilt power lines, lots of new transformers. It would boost the total cost of the project by about 75 percent. I mean, it, it was just exorbitant. You could not, if that was the true cost, these projects would not be built. That price did come down over the following months, but in the end, they were still on the hook for hundreds of millions of dollars, part of which they had to pay right away. They missed that deadline, had to drop out of line. Most wind and solar companies can tell similar stories, and there's a big push now to shake up the system with with new federal rules for the interconnection queue, so it moves faster. In the future, local utilities may pay for some of these required upgrades. And there's new federal funding for power line projects. Some of these changes are even bringing Lyle Jack's project back from the dead. He's optimistic. I want something good for our people. You know, I want something big for our people. They're getting ready to jump back into that interconnection queue. For NPR News, I'm Dan Charles, Pine Ridge, South Dakota. Support for Planet Money comes from Workday, committed to helping organizations adapt to change, using real-time data to uncover insights, stay decision-ready, and prepare for whatever's next. The finance, HR, and planning system for a changing world. athletes faced harsh consequences for accepting money and gifts while playing college sports. But two years ago, the NCAA changed the rules, allowing athletes to profit off their name, image, and likeness, otherwise known as NIL. 
WVXU's Zach Carrion explains why the rules are making a big difference for local student athletes. At the University of Cincinnati, athletes from almost every sport have found ways to reap the benefits of these new rules right away, signing deals with companies and even starting their own businesses. When the school joins one of the biggest athletic conferences this July, the Big 12, it could mean even more lucrative deals for its athletes. One is Dante Corleone. He's a defensive lineman on UC's football team. He says he's making the most of the opportunities NIL has to offer, and unlike those before him, he's able to make money and live comfortably while he's in college. I got basically get anything that I want without having like, to worry about next week or anything like that. I'm just in a, a good spot. Corleone is one of the best players in the country at his position. He was named a preseason All-American back in March and could soon be heading to the pros. In the meantime, he's supporting himself by promoting companies through social media and building his own personal brand with a new persona derived from his name, Dante or Don Corleone. Some fans, this nickname the Godfather, and I just, I just took it to my brand. I post something in the comments, they always put the Godfather, so I just very well. After two years, NIL is still new territory for universities and students alike. That's why UC brought in Greg Harrell, an NIL general manager hired by the university to educate students on the business side of things. It's really kind of like a one-on-one -on -one counselor experience where, where you would get in other areas of campus uh, where, they're, uh, where they're just seeking support and getting experience uh, in business development, marketing, and sales. Corleone meets with Harold weekly to help shape his brand and identify companies he'd like to work with. He says the two most important things he's gotten out of NIL are being able to give money to his mother who raised him on her own and the business parts he's learned at UC, which will help prepare him for bigger paychecks at the next level. Beyond the money, I just want to build like, connections with uh, different various companies. So when I, if I do make to leave, I can just like come back and we can do like a little partnership again. But the impact of name, image, and likeness can be felt far outside the lines of the football field. Cameron Callahan is a women's lacrosse player who led the Bearcats in scoring and netted more goals this past season than any other freshman in the country. She's jumping right into the business of NIL. Through the university, she's learned how to market herself despite the lack of attention her sport typically receives. It doesn't matter if you're the best athlete or the most popular athlete, like it's all about building your brand. Callahan is still figuring out what her brand is, but that hasn't stopped her from signing her own deals. UC's Harold says many transactions between businesses and college athletes aren't always the big money deals we tend to think of. Previously, before NIL, an athlete couldn't accept a free meal. Well, now you can go into uh, a local restaurant here in Clifton. You can accept it in exchange for a social media post or something. So. Uh, and I also didn't have to be cast. And that's what Callahan took advantage of. She says her first taste of the NIL business was a smoothie place near campus that asked her to make TikToks promoting the company. In return, it's like, uh, like a gift card for the whole month or just food, free smoothies all month. So I was able to like get some smoothies for my, my coaches and my teammates. So that's been fun, especially just because I can share it with everyone around me. Social media is a huge part of NIL, which Callahan says gives women a leg up, allowing them to pursue different opportunities from their male counterparts. I definitely see more females on TikTok creating like good content. Um, I know the, the males are working on it. I have a couple of friends from the track team that have to give some lessons to about TikTok. As the Bearcats prepare to join the Big 12, no one can say for sure how much it will expand the business prospects of UC student athletes, but they do know the bigger stage will mean more exposure and name recognition for everyone on campus, Harold says. You could be playing games now in different parts of the country that you weren't before, and maybe it's a uh, connection to the University of Cincinnati uh, has a higher uh, level of interest from a brand standpoint. So we're obviously thrilled, we're excited. Everybody here can't wait till July 1st. And I think it'll certainly make a huge impact on, on NIL at UC. And it could open new doors for Dante, the godfather Corleone, who now has his sights set on the restaurant business this coming year. I like to do NIL with like Billy's Pizza or the Skyline, you know, I love my Skyline. I gotta still reach out for that, but those are two of my main like, things I wanna do. UC held events on campus and sent athletes to a summit in Atlanta last